Well, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to this first of a series of four webinars specifically focused on the issue of uh, what happens next uh, after the pandemic. What do we do? How do we how do we get reform to happen? What is the role of technology as we go forward in in this uh, in this extraordinary times that we see ourselves in? We have the most remarkable panel this afternoon. Uh, delighted to, to say that we have Henrik Holloway, who is the Director General of DG Move, obviously. We have uh, the Director General of Eurocontrol, Mr. Eamon Brennan as well. And we have the uh, Executive Director, not the Director General of uh, CESAR, Mr. Florian Guillemot as well, to have a, a conversation, 45 minutes, focused on where we go, how do we get there, and what sort of things do we need to make that happen. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I hope that you are too. My name is Andrew Charlton, by the way, um, and it's my pleasure to, to host this conversation today or to moderate this conversation today. Henrik, if I could maybe start with you. Um, these are extraordinary times. Aviation seems to go through a crisis every 10 years, but this is a really good crisis, isn't it? Thank you, thank you, Andrew, and it's uh, it's it's great to be here, and uh, and of course, uh, uh, good good afternoon to uh, to all the audience as well. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, well, indeed, it is an extraordinary crisis. I don't know if it's an extraordinary opportunity. I mean, normally you say that crisis are always an opportunity, and it will be stupid of us if we will not be able to uh, use that for our benefit. But uh, uh, we are also in the middle of something that uh, we have never experienced before, and uh, we also don't know how it is going to unfold. I think uh, we have a good reason today to uh, to be um, somewhat uh, optimistic. I mean, Eamon will tell you more about the figures, but I think that the two important data that we have seen 15th of June when the EU opened up and 1st of July when the EU has opened up also to some of the third countries have also resulted in a jump in the number of flights in the European airspace and that's definitely good and we are from what we used to be like uh, uh, 5% of the normal about 35% of the normal and I think that also shows that uh, there is hope if, if everything goes fine but we also need to put things in the bigger perspective I mean if you talk about the previous crisis I mean the crisis 10 years ago which is the closest uh, uh, then um, we had a structural issue we had a structural issue which actually had a major impact for a long time to come today we didn't have a structural problem as such I mean in, I, and I mean in the economies in general in the societies or in the aviation uh, the uh, the crisis has been imposed uh, and uh, and in that sense um, uh, it has stopped everything. We haven't, haven't seen that in the civil aviation over its uh, lifetime of last hundred years. But uh, but at the same and and that means that we would need to make this time now into the possibilities uh, in the future. We need to accelerate certain processes. It is clear that uh, there are two overriding things, or three, I would say. Uh, and, and and let's start from the assumption that either it's going to take. Uh, two years as the optimists say, or either it's going to take five years as the pessimists say when the aviation is back in the pre-crisis levels, then uh, it will come back. And if we are not using this time, and let's rather, let's rather take it from the point of view that um, uh, this time is shorter rather than longer, that if we are not going to use this time, we are going to face exactly the same kind of challenges we had. And you remember also, if we would have been here half a year ago, we would have been talking about the problem of the capacity. We would have been talking about the capacity in the air, capacity on the ground, the availability of workforce, all that. These problems for the moment have been, let's say, compartmentalized elsewhere, but they have not in no way been solved or not gone away. We made this mistake 10 years ago where we thought that, OK, now certain things are not there anymore. So probably they disappear. They came back and they were much deeper. So now I think that it is very important to make sure that this modernization will go ahead. And as I said, two things which I want to underline. Sustainability, we all know. This is also not going to go anywhere. The fact that we have no emissions today actually will give away to many to say, oh, that's great. Why shouldn't we have it all the time like that? But it is definitely accelerating also the innovation which is taking place, including, of course, the innovation in relation to the other propulsion systems in aviation. I'm not in that sense in no way a fool, I hope. Uh, it's not going to happen in 10, it's not going to happen perhaps in 15 years, but we need to lay the ground now so that it can happen in 20 to 30 years. And it is possible to, to look into the other option. Hydrogen, of course, um, 
electricity, but also at the same time to look at the, at, at the thing related to the sustainable aviation fuels, which are absolutely essential. And of course, the whole package of measures that we have in order to make aviation greener. If aviation is to come back, it has to show that it is a greener aviation and the path is going to go to that direction because otherwise, as we also know about the trends in the society, we will run into major problems. The other one being, of course, the, um, the issue about the digitalization, also with the new entrances, I would say. We all know about, of course, uh, the drones, but also we can also mention uh, supersonic, for example. And these are going to be new things in the aviation network. And I think this is also something which might also be to a certain extent accelerated. Drones, for sure. Supersonic, of course, Europe has a bit of a different view than perhaps the North America, but, but nevertheless, they are also here to come. And this comes with two other things, I would say. The recovery, which is first bringing the confidence of the travelers back, which is essential. And this is related to the health safety. And I also use the opportunity to say that uh, we would have had no planes in the air today if uh, EASA and together with the ECDC and the Commission wouldn't have come up with their health safety protocol, so-called guidelines, which has actually allowed aviation to restore uh, after the borders or at least most of the borders and the current were opened and quarantines were lifted. And of course, the other thing is also the matter about the, the resilience, because we all know that we need to build probably more resilience in the system, last but not least. And that is also something that this crisis, we need to see how to keep it, is also the people in aviation. There are very highly qualified, highly skilled jobs. And of course, now some of those jobs are lost. And yeah. it's very important not to lose these people. So I think this is all we need to keep in mind today, tomorrow, and day after tomorrow. And this is going to be all part of the next years to come. Thank you. And part of our conversation today, I'm pleased to say as well. Eamon, Henrik spoke about the recovery, which we're starting to see. Eurocontrol put out new figures this morning. I'm wondering if you'd be so kind as to just let us know um, what, the, what the situation is now. Okay, good morning to, or good afternoon to everybody. <clears throat> I suppose the key thing for today was the 1st of July saw a resumption of major activity. I mean, we're very pleased. We had 12,700 flights today, but realistically, that's one third of what we would have had this time last year. So, Andrew, what we're, we're looking at really is by the end of August, we were, our, our projections are that we'll get back to about 50%, maybe a little bit more, 55%. Uh, what we're looking at today is yesterday was a resumption of activities by EasyJet and by Ryanair. Um, modest growth by Lufthansa Air France, and you will see a little bit more. One thing that's holding the whole system back at the moment is the United Kingdom, because the United Kingdom and Ireland have quarantine, so you're not seeing any growth from IAG or any growth really from that market. And the load factors out of the UK yesterday were very poor, but much better from continental Europe. So I'm kind of moderately optimistic from a figure's point of view, that we get to 55, maybe 60% by the end of August, and then it's going to be a very slow slog, maybe three years or so, to get back to where we were in 2019. If I could just mention what Henrik said about where we are. The last time Henrik was giving a speech like this, and he's correct, he was giving out to us about lack of capacity, of capacity in the system. And it's important we don't forget that, because if we don't, we will be right back where we started very quickly. So I think it's important that we look at making sure that we use the period now to invest wisely in CapEx. And, you know, the sustainability agenda is there, and we know about the EU Green Deal and all this. But at the end of, at the, end of the day, guys, the most important thing is that the business stays intact. And to me, there's another factor there that Henrik probably didn't mention, mention, but I think seeing as we're discussing aviation generally, it's the whole level playing field in the marketplace after the COVID. Because as you know, once the COVID happened, the airlines started to run out of cash very quickly. And, you know, we all know that the airlines live on forward bookings for cash. But you're after looking at huge bailouts for KLM, for Air France, for Alitalia, Lufthansa, like bailouts you could never dream of. Even Lufthansa saying they got more money than they needed. And then you have the other carriers, such as, say, the EasyJets and the Ryanairs and the Whizzes, you know, operating on a different model. So the question is, what's the level playing field? And then there's the issue if you look at, for instance, linking with Henrik's sustainability. Many of them have put environmental conditions into this state aid, such as the Dutch, you know, the French, uh, if there's a train going that way, you can't have an internal flight. So 
we're looking at something that this is a crisis and we need to make sure that we benefit from this crisis and do some things differently because if we don't we're going to end up in two and a half years time in the same position i was on a, comp a similar webex with the fabric member states uh two days ago and i did say to the ceo of dfs look carl's rule was a problem last year let's make sure that it's not a problem now in two years time use the opportunity to sort things out so think that i think that's important so i leave it at there i think some of the points there that i'm raising about state aid i'll throw them back to henry to sort out indeed i look forward to that what was the response incidentally to the let's not make carl's rule a problem question I, th I think they genuinely got the message this is the time to do it it's a genuine opportunity to use the opportunity but look the, the big issue andrew here is if we're really honest with atm and we'll come to it a minute is the system is not scalable you know mm -hmm. it's either here or it's here and that's it which it it's not able to do this it's not able to shrink and come out and airlines are much better at this but we're looking at a crisis I mean a cash crisis so it's 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 not a financial economic downturn like before you know the, the final point i just want to make is that on the 18th of january andrew i signed off on the euro control risk assessment you know every organization does a risk assessment and i was leafing through it this morning nowhere does it say pandemic <laughs> okay so this is a new this is something new well, I mean, well, it's not. We've had one a century, of course, but uh, it's just our turn for this century. Florian, all roads seem to lead to you, don't they? I mean, Henrik talked about the need for digitalization, for resilience. Uh, Eamon talked about scalability. We need to bring together all of these things. Where do you, where do you see where the opportunities are for us to do exactly what Eamon's just been talking about, to, to fix the problems that we currently have? Um, thank you and good afternoon to all. Um, well, I think um, as any kind of crisis, uh, we can uh, try to use it as much as we can as an opportunity and uh, there's indeed a lot of uh, things that are going on uh, um, by the different stakeholders to cope with uh, the short term situation. Uh, but I do think that this is really uh, an opportunity that we have to uh, look at what's coming next. Uh, and uh, as Henry quite uh, rightly stated, the problems that we had in the past are not going to disappear with this crisis, they will come back. Um, and I mean, just to use a, a kind of uh, image, uh, we've always had problems in ATM um, to upgrade system, to uh, um, uh, mobilize energy uh, and investment on the changes. Uh, because basically we are running a system which is operating uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week and so on. Uh, it's like uh, if you would like to uh, change a, a wheel of a car uh, while the car is, uh, is, uh, dry, is, is being driven. Um, here we have an opportunity maybe to do things differently, uh, to use the resources that we have um, to uh, work on concrete projects and uh, we might come to that later on. Uh, and to accelerate the pace of the transformation that we uh, uh, started with uh, with Cesar uh, over the last uh, 10 years to make sure that we get there and that we don't get there too late um, compared to the traffic evolution. And the second thing maybe to highlight is that uh, like any crisis, uh, um, it's a, a kind of slowdown and we do see that uh, on the traffic trends, uh, but it is uh, as well, generally speaking, an accelerator for other things. And uh, what we have to consider is that there is a massive, massive acceleration going on uh, because of this crisis on the technology, actually, which are at the core of Cesar, at the core of the transformation we're aiming at uh, in ATM. Um, and uh, it is going really to uh, make a big change everywhere in the economy. And I'm convinced that this is as well something that will happen uh, in uh, uh, air traffic management and in aviation at large. If you look at what's going on, uh, because of the sanity situation in, in areas like robotics, but as well how we are going to use data to fight against the pandemic and so on. This will be massive accelerators that we can use as well in our own domain. Uh, so that basically in two weeks, in two years time, um, if hopefully the, the traffic uh, pickups uh, at that time uh, at the same level as we had uh, uh, last year uh, or uh, two years ago, uh, we don't end up with the same situation uh, on the capacity and uh, we can extend uh, maybe the discussion on that but we do have today's solutions from a technological standpoint that bring um, not just capacity they bring scalability to the system the ability to cope uh, with the tra traffic demand where it is and when it is but aren't we a <laughs> problem here i mean Eamon mentioned the fact that the airlines are in a, a terrible cash uh, crisis, cash flow crisis, that of course has an impact onto the ANSPs as well because if airlines aren't flying, they're not paying anything. 
um, to the ANSPs. How do we reconcile the need for accelerating our expenditure or ex accelerating our research, accelerating our, our technological transformation with the fact that we don't have any money? Where does all that fit together? Who wants to pick on that? Sorry? Is that to me? Or yes, yes. Or, 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 to everyone. It's to everyone, but we'll start with you. No, I, I mean, I, I can start. To me, to me, the, the months we are living in right now are um, uh, very uh, critical in terms of uh, uh, securing the future investments. Uh, I think that the situation is so hard from a financial standpoint, from a cash flow standpoint, that of course immediate measures have to be taken in terms of uh, uh, making sure that uh, um, the, the costs are cut uh, in the system so that uh, basically we can uh, address the situation in the short term. But that would be a really big mistake if we hit too bad the investment in this period because we will need this investment in the future. We will need as well uh, the people uh, who have to continue to work on those projects, on those activities to fix the system, to upgrade the system. So, I mean, to me, this is, if I, if I would have to, uh, uh, mention a priority today, and this is an engineer speaking, it would not be about technology. It would be from a financial standpoint to make sure that we can uh, safeguard investments in the next coming uh, years and months. So safety, let, me, let, me, let me, Andrew, let me come in. As well. to say, Henry, that yes. seems like a political question to me. Yes, yes, definitely. But uh, but but let let let's go back also a, a couple of steps. I mean, first and foremost, uh, uh, to say uh, with what 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 has been already underlined, this is very much of a cash crisis. But what does it change? Nothing, because uh, the cash crisis has created a much bigger problem as such in the whole system. So I think that's that's the first thing. Secondly, it's the whole ecosystem which is impacted from. Each and every component of that ecosystem has been impacted. And as we all know, there is a lot of interdependency. So why, what is needed now also is that uh, there is a certain sense of solidarity and certain willingness to, uh, to pull it together. Because there cannot be any winner. There are only losers for the moment. And it is very important to stick together throughout the aviation ecosystem, because what we see is that we need each and every component of that. And each of them are impacted. It's not only about, you know, airlines are not flying, so there is no ATM revenues, but it's also the same with the airports. The airports are also making huge investments. Many of those airports have been also in the past in the system or, or let's say under the pressure because there is not uh, enough capacity on the ground. And we knew that this is going to be a much bigger and the real structural problem in the medium long term. For me, it was always to come a bigger problem than, for example, the issue about the capacity in the air, where I do see that there is possible to find solutions. So, so I think that is that is one thing of it. And of course, we have also seen many weaknesses of the current system. The question is, are we able to address them efficiently? Is there willingness to address them? And can we bring a change? If we take the ATM system, then obviously it's the integral part of the infrastructure. Again, full interdependency, there is no question about that. And um, but this, as the system is not scalable, we have to deal with a surplus of resources that are necessary to operate the system in times of reduced traffic. And we also know that it can be vice versa. So the future system in that sense has to have this scalability and also more resilience. I mean, resilience is now one of the sort of new key words because uh, everybody is talking about it. The same we used to talk about perhaps the lack of capacity. We now talk about resilience, uh, uh, which means that we have to be ready for any kind of eventualities. And of course, this all boils down also, uh, for me, a faster uptake of, uh, of, of new technology, new digital solutions. And that's also which very much is done uh, under the uh, Florian's watch. And, and, and supported also uh, by, uh, by the work of Eurocontrol, which also shows that we need to bring those two things together. And, and that's also what we have been talking about in terms of the deployment. And, and we start and we need to accelerate also the deployment across the board, which has not been the case necessarily. Then, of course, the financing of the ATM being a very big issue. And of course, the current regulation was not tailored for such an unprecedented situation. And we are working hard in consultation with stakeholders to come to a fair solution that works for all. I know that 
uh, there are many views about that. But I mean, there is very difficult also to uh, to come and find a, a, a good middle way so that uh, everybody has equally uh, got the pain. But we need to we need to do that because again, as I say, there are there are no winners. And 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 of course, uh, <clears throat> these are I think uh, many of those examples that uh, we need to deal with, and we need to see how it will be possible to accelerate the deployment to accelerate the modernization and to uh, to use the crisis and to deploy the new technologies and and to what extent do you think henrik that it's also an opportunity to simplify what we do you you said that we've got all of these people that need to work together to what extent does that mean actually to start to cut down some of the the number of players in the industry, if you like, and to cut down the interfaces between them and to try to get rid of the old things that we used to do and to try to find new ways to do things. Look, simplification is always the most complicated exercise. <laughs> Everybody talks about the simplification, but when we come to reality, it turns, that, uh, turns out that uh, the uh, uh, certain complexities which are inbuilt have been there for a long time and nobody wants to get rid of that. I mean, obviously, we need to see where, where we can uh, simplify. And, uh, and the same is also concerning uh, the, uh, the regulatory framework. But uh, at the same time, of course, we know that aviation is also a very regulated area. And uh, there are certain areas like, say, I would also say security, for example, where you can't really simplify that much. But uh, but again, uh, it is it is time to uh, to look into that as well to the to the extent when it comes possible. Let's also not forget that sometimes uh, uh, certain complexities are, uh, and and certain regulation are also asked by the stakeholders themselves because they feel that they are much better served when certain things have been uh, put on the table on the European level and made sure that they are enforced uh, equally in the European Union, which of course is also the essence of the uh, single European aviation market. And that is something we need to uh, defend and guard. I mean, I am slightly worried about this as well, because uh, we know that the uh, single European aviation market, which has uh, served us extremely well and based on the three main pillars, which is uh, uh, competition, connectivity and affordability, is uh, being shaken for the moment uh, quite a lot. And uh, and and I hope that, uh, that once the dust is settled, uh, it will take some time. We would uh, still be in a position when it continues to serve the European citizens well and and i think that is also where we need to focus our our, our things uh, uh when when we are looking at the bigger picture uh, the single european market but also of course the single european sky i mean if i can oh, well, if we I are can, not there yet <laughs> it possible takes a little longer i mean if i could turn to you what what sort of i mean i, I was really interested in uh, uh, henrik saying that the simplification is really complicated um do you see any sorts of simplifications that we could we could put in place changes that we can make to start to take advantage of some of the, the place that we're at okay andrew um may, maybe what i just might take a step backwards for a moment and then i'll answer that question i mean if if, if you ask me what what's the main thing i've learned from atm from this crisis and you know i've been in this industry a long time the first thing i think i need to say is that you know the atm system needs to needs to stay operating we, we've got to accept that the system actually broadly needs to stay operating for cargo and all this so that's a realization europe has got to stay going the second thing i think that's important though is that it's becoming very apparent in a crisis is that the states and the nsps have a very common interest i mean they need to keep their airspace operating so effectively this idea that the nsps are a different category than the states it's in many cases in a crisis it's not true because they look to their owners for cash when they get into trouble and that's normal you would expect this you see this everywhere in fact the airlines are doing the same so to me the states and the nsps very aligned the third thing i would just like to say is that they don't have the limit, they don't have options, NSPs, easy to scale down because they have a huge amount of fixed costs and they have union agreements and all of this kind of thing. So it's not easy to be scalable. And I think that that's a very important thing to say. And I think the, the last thing then is the fact that they don't have anywhere else to go. They don't have any other market to go. So it does bring us to a key point. And the key point is that we need to roll out technology that brings some kind of a change. I would go back and what um, Florian says, look, it's about cost to an extent, but ultimately the regulatory system that Henry talked about, we sort that out, not to everybody's satisfaction, but you can't please everybody. But we got to talk about technology and we have to start deploying technology that makes a change. And this is where the airspace architecture study that we that we introduced there last year with Cesar is very important. We need to re-simulate 
European airspace in total. Look at cross-border sectorizations. Look at dynamic sectorizations. Look at free route airspace. Things that bring a real change. Now, this might involve going back to the drawing board with some ANSPs and say, look, it makes more sense that this is operated from here, this is operated from there, in a kind of a, a very collaborative way. And this is where I believe the network manager and the ND tech and all these kind of things for deploying technology will come about. You know, we have so many organizations in Europe, we get confused, but we have to start deploying technology. And I think this is the lesson that's come from all of the investment that we've made in Cesar and Cesar deployment is we're not deploying quick enough. So for me, the lesson for this is to start rolling stuff out now pretty fast and losing things that we don't need and make it a little bit uncomplicated if we can. And Henrik's point is, you know, making it uncomplicated is, is, is actually becoming complicated, but we need to have less players, easier tasks and try to just get on with it. Because to finish, when this whole single European sky thing was started, you recall um, way back in Madame Palazzio's time, she wanted to go for a top-down approach and everybody argued, no, 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 this won't work. Let's try a bottom-up approach. So we formed the fabs and we formed everything and up we went. But we're now here 20 years later and we haven't really made some progress. So there's some kind of a combination of, you know, a strong leadership from the Commission and easier implementation and maybe less prescriptive regulations might be helpful in the years ahead. Thank you. That, I mean, the risk we always run in Europe, I think, is that we go top up and bottom down. Um, Florian, that sounds like the perfect lead-in for you from Eamon there, wasn't it? What technologies can we implement quickly? What technologies should we dismiss now and and where should we go where should the investments be made to to capitalize on this crisis uh well i mean i'm not going to go into uh, all the, the solutions that uh, have been tabled through cesar but uh, i would say that if uh, i refer to the airspace architecture uh, studies that uh, Eamon mentioned uh, there are definitely two areas um, which uh, are essential uh, the first one is in relation to the automation. The more we can bring uh, automation support uh, to the system, the more scalable we will be. I mean, that's uh, just like any uh, um, uh, service domain. Uh, and the second one is uh, on the virtualization techniques. So basically the ability to provide services uh, independently from the geographical solution. This is something that uh, allows potentially to uh, move the capacity where and where when it is needed. Uh, and as well to bring uh, uh, additional layers in terms of uh, resilience. I mean, today we have a system uh, whereby um, you have those uh, airspace cells which are uh, just adjacent to one another. Uh, and when one close, nobody else is able to uh, uh, take over uh, at least a minimum of uh, flights happening in this uh, airspace. This is something where technology, again, can bring solutions uh, to make it uh, more resilient and uh, more scalable. Uh, I believe as well... Um, we Florian, we could do now, couldn't we? I mean, Eurocontrol figures show that already we've got a terrible mismatch between demand and or capacity and, and demand. Even on Eurocontrol's, I think, quite conservative numbers, they think there's a 20% mismatch there. But surely the network manager alone could just make sure that we, we do some of that transferring. Do you think that there's some technology that would allow us to go beyond that, to go past that, to, to be more dynamic? I mean, I mean, to me, the whole point, coming back to, to uh, what the network manager is doing, um, it's really that uh, if I look at uh, situations where we have a shortfall capacity of capacity, what do we do? Uh, we basically move the traffic where we have capacity. I think we need to change that logic. We need to move the capacity where the demand is uh, and where it is effective to fly uh, the aircraft like this. And just to pick up uh, one second on that, uh, uh, my view is that as well, we have here an opportunity because of the uh, uh, optimal trajectories that we are flying uh, right now in the airspace, to rebuild the system around that in terms of sustainability. Uh, and uh, I think this is as well something which we can be uh, um, uh, looking at in terms of uh, maybe making simulations, uh, as uh, Eamon mentioned, uh, at European scale, on how we can uh, ensure that we rebuild the system around optimal trajectory and not the other way around. Right. But both of I mean, I, thank you. I, I, that's very helpful. And I found those very useful explanations. But I can't help but think, Henrik, that there's going to be some regulatory problems trying to do either of those things. Uh, is DG move up to the fight for this to try to make those sorts of changes? Well, Digimove is always off to a fight, uh, uh, even 
if it is uh, a challenging fight i think we have we have we have demonstrated that but i'm also uh, very uh, realistic about what can be done and what cannot be done i i also wanted to uh, to come in i'm i'm trying with with one eye to uh, uh, to keep also uh, the uh, following the the chat and uh, and there has also been comments about automation and of course uh, i think this is something that i i cannot agree more i mean uh, the uh, when we talk about the digitalization then automation is of course uh, integral and separable part of that uh, and, uh, and and of course that will also bring changes but we also need to have the necessary framework and procedures and processes ready to um, uh, 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 to embrace it what i mean by that let's take for example with the further automation then article licensing rules also need to evolve towards more technology and system related requirements uh, while at the same time of course keeping safety uh, of the system uh, intact which is not necessarily the case today so it's not only when you are deploying new technology you also need to make sure that it is uh, uh, entirely embedded in the way how uh, how this tech new technology is also being handled and of course i believe that by by joining forces aviation atm will be in a position to also accelerate the uh, artificial intelligence development and also unlock the potential of the benefit of the whole community and the european network in particular i think artificial intelligence is definitely going to be a big part of the digitalization it will open up possibilities that we are not entirely aware about uh, today but uh, i believe that this is something where we also uh, need to um, uh, very closely follow and and being able also in a regulatory way to make sure that it is there because whatever there are new solutions uh, of course in aviation in particular it has to go through a very uh, long and also very thorough process uh, uh, in order to make sure that uh, they comply uh, with uh, with all the new safety requirements but that also probably uh, brings along with the the need to, to change the need to, uh, to how to how, how we look at it and and the need how to how we also use the technology another thing is also when we are let's talk about florian's uh, uh, solutions which are i think absolutely essential uh, then um, the problem with some of them is also that uh, they need to be deployed simultaneously by the different players of the aviation ecosystem but that is not necessarily the case and we have seen that you know something which requires for example that they exist on the ground and in the air and if they exist only in the air and not on the ground then you know the investments are not really uh, paid off today because of the cash crisis we are also in a situation we have to understand where there is much less money for um uh, the uh, innovation and for the research and development. So, on one hand, for the ATM, I see a huge opportunity here for our CESAR projects. And I was very glad to hear also that the ATM community in general is committed to CESAR research and development and the deployment. And we need to focus more on that uh, and the research and development industrialization and the, and the deployment phases and more on operational needs and environmental impact and so on through digitalization, automation. This goes without saying. That's one hand, but on the other hand, I mean, we see that uh, uh, all the bigger players who are also part of the Cesar pro pro project, and I'm talking about bigger players here, have major problems today to come up with a, with a, with a co-financing, with the financing. We need to be innovative now as well. We will have the continuation of Cesar. There is no doubt it is essential. We need that. But on the other hand, we need to think also how we are going to use this opportunity that is there uh, and, 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 and to get it front loaded, to get also uh, certain higher degrees of co-financing so that actually things can be done. Because if we don't manage it uh, smartly, we will be in a situation where actually we might even have a gap in deployment and, and that is the worst thing that can happen today. So the question is, okay, we have less money, but nevertheless, how do we get maximum out of the pro programs for today in order to uh, to be able to, to put these things uh, uh, actively in, in the market? So there's quite a lot of things that we also need to do. And it is actually for all of us, because um, me as a chair and Eamon as a vice chair of the Cesar Administrative Board, and of course, um, uh, as uh, Florian as the executive director for us, this is also how to, how, to, how to make the best use out of this project. And if we have the extension of Cesar, how it is going to serve the whole aviation community in its entirety in a holistic manner. Right. And I think there's a lot of very interesting subjects that you've raised there. And as you rightly say, some of the chat is on issues of AI and so on. But I'd also like to talk to you about the, well, maybe this is a question for you, Eamon. The, the, the system is incredibly fragmented and it's not just fragmented at a state level, which it is, but it's also fragmented at a technology provider level and so forth. Is one of the cost savings to 
one of the easy cost savings to be for Henrik to put in place a regulation that says everybody's got to use open source software. Would that solve the problem? Well, it would help. Um, but but let's 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 be pragmatic here, and Andrew. What, what's really important here is, is that you've got some kind of a common European standard, and I think that they we've got to you use this crisis to pick up the lessons for Cesar. And for me, the lessons for Cesar is that we've got to deploy faster. And I think this is nothing new. We've discussed it at the borders. Henrik the German, every single time we talk about it, we talk about IOP. We talk about all the big projects that we're trying to do. But we can't all the time be depending on regulations to solve our problem. I think it's not fair in the Commission. We have to come up with working arrangements that deal with the projects. And for me, you know, the big opportunity is if you take, for instance, the network manager, which everybody works with and has a very good relationship with the MD tech and the, 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 the board that works there, this is a place where we should get all the technology agreed and all the deployments agreed. So Cesar should just lead into the network manager and get it deployed. We shouldn't be having arguments in 2020 about technology. I mean, it's pretty shocking in Europe that we have two or three large suppliers of air traffic management systems systems and we still haven't got IOP rolled out the same way. And IOP is basic interoperability. It's something we tried to do with the Egypt system back in the 90s. So, you know, there is a role to say, look, let's not be prescriptive with regulations, but let's set out what the standards that are required and then everybody make it, but you've got to have the interface standards important. And then if I could just make one last point, Andrew. Sure. We're now 30 years on from whom we did dealt with this problem first. And the question is labor mobility. You know, pilots move between airlines, they move all over the continent, they move, you know, all over the world. In air traffic controllers, they don't move. They join the DSNA at the age of 18, and the only move they make is from Rems to maybe to Aix or to Marseille. This is all that happens. And the, the problem is, is that systems have not evolved. We have a situation where when you become an air traffic controller, you're, you're licensed on an area. In my view, we should change this concept totally and you should be licensed on a system. You know, and the system should be certified European-wise by IASA for safety. And then you're licensed on a Thales system, you're licensed on the Copan system, you're licensed on an Indra system. This needs to be the way. It's simply too complicated. And one of the reasons we always end up in trouble with air traffic control is because we've never addressed the issue also of labor mobility. So it's hand in hand, technological improvement, labor mobility. Wow, interesting. So, Florian, what's the role of um, of Caesar in in this sort of standard setting area? Do you see it as a role there, or and and that's my first question. My second question is, Eamon said we need to deploy faster. What's holding us back? Um, well, on the uh, aspect of standardisation, uh, yes. I mean, one of the objectives of Caesar is to make sure that we uh, end up with. Uh, uh, um, standards at uh, European level and uh, hopefully that can become as well a standard uh, from a worldwide standpoint. I think this is where as well uh, we have uh, um, some challenges from a European perspective to stay ahead of uh, the other regions in the world. Um, I think that we've been quite successful on that uh, and um, obviously uh, we had a very good already uh, success in terms of uh, the standards for information management, for instance, extending information now uh, is uh, the latest standard from ICAO are based on the uh, work that has been performed in the context of CESAR. Uh, it is not sufficient, however, and uh, maybe that's one area that I want to, to pick on. I think it's, a, it's an absolute necessity, uh, but it is nevertheless not sufficient. And maybe this crisis will help us to be uh, more clever than we've been in the past in terms of how we invest. I strongly believe that the question now will be to invest on the right technology and there um, definitely the standard will uh, have a key role to play, uh, but as well to invest in the right way, um, which means not in a fragmented way. If I look at one of the cost elements that we have uh, in the system today, uh, which is the CNS infrastructure, I don't have the latest uh, figures in uh, mind, but when we uh, worked on the airspace architecture study about two years ago at the start, uh, this was around 1 billion euro every year. We have a very fragmented CNS infrastructure. We have radars all over the place. We have VHF antennas, which are uh, building um, uh, problems for ourselves in terms of uh, 
uh, uh, spectrum uh, saturation and so on. Uh, we need to look at that because this is as well where we can save costs and where we can make uh, investments which are meaningful at continental level. Uh, this is really for me one area to uh, address the issue. Um, and I think we have to really change the mindset from that standpoint. Uh, we have to work on the fact that today we have two states in Europe which have difficulties to exchange their radar information where actually you can see now uh, all the traffic from the skies from satellite constellation. We do even see the traffic in China and uh, we have the numbers uh, uh, in the report from Eurocontrol every week now. So uh, we have to change really the mindset of what matters for the future of aviation, what matters for the future of uh, ATM. And this is a collective effort where we do not need regulation. I mean, we will need regulation for sure uh, to incentivize uh, the development and the deployment of technology. Coming back to your second question about uh, acceleration, we need to make sure that the early movers, the ones that are ready to move fast, that have already done so, are incentivized by the system, that they have an interest in doing it. Uh, while today, somehow, it is a bit the opposite. Uh, they have basically somehow an interest to wait and see the others to upgrade their system and then to come uh, once uh, everybody has done it. We need to revert this logic. We need to create a critical mass of the early movers that will drive the system forward, again, investing in the right technology, but as well in the right way. I don't know which bit of that story you tell for and bothers me more, that that there are two states that refuse to exchange radar data or that there are two states that use radars, but that's a, a different matter, I guess. The um, we, We're just about out of time, so I, but I've still got a couple of things I'd like to talk about if I could. So very quickly, uh, Henrik, is this the great opportunity to get rid of all the regulations which we now see that we don't need? Um, is what, what, what is the Commission going to do in this context? Well, it is obviously an opportunity, but um, uh, what is uh, obsolete for one might not be obsolete uh, for another. So uh, I think uh, you can't uh, um, draw the conclusions uh, very fast. I mean, we are now in the in the first, uh, or we have just had a few months. I mean, we are been focusing over the last month solely on the. Um, crisis management and uh, and now it is finally a little bit of more time to uh, to try to see how to how to plan the future and uh, and i think for us the uh, the most important thing today is is obviously to get the uh, ces 2 plus proposal adopted and i believe that this can also help in in number of ways uh, uh, not only in advancing the single european sky but also in order to be used to uh, uh, insert maybe some degree of uh, simplification as well as, as trying to uh, optimize the, uh, the the certain uh, regulations uh, so that is now our, our first priority and we are currently in the middle of the inter-service consultation in the commission with the aim of still being able to, uh, to adopt the proposal before the summer holidays and, uh, and and I believe that also in this context we will generally need to take a wider approach uh, uh, on many issues it, again uh, it's not only about the, uh, the 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 regulatory framework it is also what we have been talking about it's also about the how to accelerate the deployment are there also obstacles that are not needed uh, that uh, are actually holding back on the deployment so I think it, it's important to have the holistic view I mean we are definitely uh, uh, looking into into those elements and we are also very grateful for uh, for any uh, good advice and uh, and useful feedback uh, which uh, will um, help us in this path i will also use the opportunity to uh, uh, to mention and advertise that uh, uh, in the end of this year uh, the commissioner for uh, for transport mrs wallian will um, uh, put on the table the um, uh, strategy for the for the smart and sustainable mobility which is looking into the recovery resilience uh, sustainability digitalization but looking holistically on on all the sectors and i think that's also a very good moment uh, to uh, come up with, uh, with with some ideas which would then be meant for the uh, for the putting on the table or implementing in the in the next years to come throughout the mandate of this commission thank you <clears throat> but isn't the i mean i'm a little bit interested henrik that you you are saying the, what's obsolete for some isn't obsolete for others isn't the question that we really should be asking here is what's necessary for europe and then just stopping at that point i'm, I'm going to leave you at that because we are running out of time and given that you, um i'm in euro control but it, it's the hints in the name you know you've got the euro in it there what what one thing would you like to see fixed most quickly 
Okay, Andrew, so I won't, I won't waste time. To me, there's just a couple of things we need to do. First of all, we need to kind of understand that we need to manage European airspace as a network. I mean, it's very fundamental, but not everybody subscribes to this. Europe is a continent. We've got to manage it with continental flows in from the west, out from the east, and vice versa. The second thing I think we need to do is support the SES2 package of reforms that the Commission are doing it. I mean, the reality is most of the reforms there come from the wise persons group that Henrik formed last year. And there are some very good ideas there that will come through. And I think these are really good. And we have to also realize that with the, with the regulations, we cannot please everybody. You know, you have monopoly situations here and they need to be carefully handled very political situations you need to be ha handled carefully. So finally, I'd just like to say this, that what's important is that we don't fractionalize as an industry, that airlines, airports, we all work together and that we make sure that when the next time this happens, that we have some a little bit more financial resilience in the system, which is something we're going to work on in Euro control, that, you know, we need maybe a little fund or something to smooth out things going forward, because this comes on you very fast and we should learn the lessons from this. Indeed. So, Florian, last word to you, if I may. What what one thing do you think we should be focusing on first and foremost? Well, uh, in my view, is is coming back to the ability to continue to invest. Um, I think this is really what we need to secure in the next coming months. But uh, again, not uh, investment for the sake of investment. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, we really need to have this uh, network approach when we make uh, investment. Uh, all what we do in aviation uh, is of a continental nature almost, and this is how we need to address uh, the investments uh, in the new technology in the future. Again, building on what we have already delivered, it's not a need to reinvent the wheel. We know what needs to be done, so let's do it. But we can only do it if we are able to safeguard investment for the future. Okay, safe, safeguarding investment for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time and I I thought we maybe there were three things that I took away that were particularly interesting. One was that we should change capacity to meet demand rather than the other way around. The second one was that uh, we should be licensing by system rather than by location. And thirdly, of course, there's nothing more complicated than simplification. I think they're three very good lessons to walk away with. I'd like to thank uh, Henrik Eamon and Florian for their time. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. And we have a, a we have a series of these. This, this is the first of four, and I look forward to uh, to seeing you then. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.